Good morning, Riverside. My name is Minister Derek Jordan, and it brings me great joy to welcome each of you to worship this morning. Now, as we're preparing our hearts and our minds to receive what God has for us today, I want to share a few things with you. If you visit our website at trcnyc.org, you'll find a number of things. You can download today's bulletin, you can share a gift, and while you're scrolling, just check out some of the incredible ways that you can support the works of the church. Last but certainly not least, we want to hear from you. We want to know how you're doing. So we invite you to please use the chat features on your phones, on your laptops, on your iPads. Reach out, say hello, greet someone, and let's stay in community with one another. Again, it's a joy to be with you. Welcome to worship.
Good morning and welcome to, again to Riverside Worship. My name is Amanda Meisenheimer and I'm the Minister of Children and Families here at Riverside. And I'm also welcoming you to what has been the set of our Vacation Bible School this week. Monday through Friday, I've been hosting Vacation Bible School for both our Freedom School community and our church school community. And we have had a lot of fun at what we call Compassion Camp. Now, in the past couple of weeks, I've heard a lot of amazing things from children. And one of our children told me a story about how people were uh, critiquing or criticizing his artwork. And I said, did you get discouraged? Did you stop drawing? And he said, you know, God created the world. And after seven days of creating the world, God looked at everything that God had created and said, this is good. So when I look at what I've created, I say, this is good. You know, whatever you're bringing today to worship, whether it be the heaviness of the tragedies we've seen this week, or joy because someone you love is safe or whole or healthy, God holds it all and calls all of our feelings good. So celebrate with me a wonderful end of a week of vacation Bible school. And here are some other announcements and news from the Riverside staff. Hello, friends. I'm Reverend Bruce Lamb, your Minister of Faith Formation. Greetings from the Education Ministry. We are continuing on with a busy summer with online programming. Bonhoeffer otherwise continues for the next three weeks on Sunday mornings. For the next two weeks, we're joined by Dr. J. Cameron Carter, looking at Bonhoeffer and race. And then our last week in August by Dr. Andrea C. White, looking at the theme of freedom. Hope you can join us, sign up online. Also, another small group we have going on right now is called Race to Action. This is a collaboration between the Education Commission and Anti-Racism Task Force. We're looking at, for the next eight weeks, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Kendi and D'Angelo's White Fragility book. Please sign up to join us. It's not too late for this important class where we're looking at these books for education, but also transformation and action as part of our ongoing anti-racism work here at Riverside. And last but not least, it is not too early to think about submitting a proposal to teach a small group class this fall at Riverside. The Adult Christian Education Committee is looking at proposals and we would love to have a proposal for you from you. So if you're interested in teaching a small group class on a book study, a book of the Bible, a specific topic, please send me an email and I'll send you the proposal form and would love to chat more with you. Our fall small group classes start on homecoming Sunday in September. Thank you. Please join us in our responsive call to worship. Holy light of the world, come shine on us. Chase our fears into the darkness far away from our hearts. Brighten our minds, let our lights emerge from within. Fill us with the courage to shine in your glory. Embolden us in the power of your unequivocal love. Let us receive your word today in worship. Amen.
Friends, would you pray with me? God of grace and God of glory, grant us your wisdom for this hour as we come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. You are our help in ages past and our help and hope in years to come. No matter how strong the storm, how threatening the waves, you call us to trust in your love and mercy and amazing grace. We rejoice in your goodness and rely on your power in all things. You remind us that you are always with us, that we do not need to fear the wind and waves of life. You are with us. Encourage us to step out and to come across these difficulties to your redeeming and transforming love. Give us courage and strength, joy and peace for all the times ahead. As we draw near to you this hour, may we immerse ourselves in your healing presence. Refresh us and renew us that we might become faithful laborers in your harvest of peace, justice, and joy. We thank you for this time together as we worship. Strengthen us to truly be your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson is from the Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, beginning with the 42nd verse. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. Then Jesus cried aloud, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in God who sent me. And whoever sees me sees God who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. I do not judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as judge, for I have not spoken on my own, but God who sent me has given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. And I know that God's commandment is eternal life. What I speak, therefore, I speak just as God has told me. This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Young children are often afraid of the dark. It's an interesting concept. As a child learns more about the world, the list of things they fear tends to grow. Some of those fears are real and some are imaginary. For example, some fears are seemingly irrational, such as falling down the toilet or being eaten by the vacuum. But the fear of the dark is perhaps the most common. One psychologist says, usually the fear of the dark hits home for kids around the ages of two or three, just as they are old enough to imagine, but not wise enough to distinguish fantasy from reality. Such fear is often difficult to overcome, and though most children eventually grow out of this fear, it can be a traumatic experience for both the child and their caretaker. However, I'm often reminded of those infamous words of Plato when he said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark, but the tragedy in life is when adults are afraid of the light. Some 20 centuries ago, a Palestinian Jew made these words immortal. I have come as light into the world so that whosoever believes in me should not remain in darkness. If I can be transparent for a moment, Jesus' words here have often troubled me. 
Oh, have I got questions for Jesus. My cultural upbringing has taught me to be skeptical of anyone who automatically associates all that is good with lightness and all that is dangerous or evil with darkness. It should be obvious, but in my cultural context, I grew up deeply resonating with the words of Langston Hughes. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. But tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me then, eat in the kitchen. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed for I too am America. Because of the community that raised me, I was always taught to see the beauty of the darkness. In fact, God often does God's best work in the dark. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, ex nihilo, out of nothing, God was working in the dark. At the first Passover, when those with blood on their doorposts were not harmed and the Israelites were freed from their bondage in Egypt, God was working in the dark. When Paul and Silas were praying and singing in a Roman jail and a great earthquake at midnight shook the foundation of the prison, setting all the captives free, God was working in the dark. And despite what any rapper running for president might say, when Harriet Tubman was liberating slaves from bondage, stealing away to freedom by following the drinking gourd in the backdrop of the night sky, God was yet again working in the dark. So exactly what does Jesus mean when he says, I have come as light into the world? so that whosoever believes in me should not remain in darkness. Well, here's some context. The last Passover is near, and with the recent raising of Lazarus from the dead, Jesus' popularity is at its peak. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, he is lauded as the promised Messiah and King. Some would say the hour of Jesus' glorification has arrived. The crowd cheers as he triumphantly enters the city. But the frustrated religious leaders conclude, look how the whole world has turned and gone after him. At a dinner, six days before Jesus would eventually go to the cross, a group of God-fearing Gentiles ran into Philip, the disciple, and boldly said to him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. At the subsequent request of Andrew and Philip, Jesus agrees to leave the dinner and speak to the crowd about his work and his mission in the world. This is the last public address Jesus makes prior to his crucifixion. And it is here that Jesus teaches a few of his most well-known lessons. Unless a grain of wheat falls onto the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Or those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Those are both powerful statements by Jesus that serve as a precursor for what is sure to come. But the task at hand is to investigate Jesus' talk about the dark. The First Testament is rich with imagery about the dark. At the beginning of creation, the darkness was over the surface of the deep, yet this was not a premortal principle of chaos to be combated by God. Instead, it was simply preparation for God's creation. There was a thick and dreadful darkness that came over Abram after leaving his father's house. And this darkness was a symbolic indication of Abram having received divine revelation. Likewise, in the days of Moses, there was a thick cloud of darkness that covered Mount Sinai as a sign of God's presence. 
Therefore, by the time we get to Jesus' day, there is so much that the darkness could have stood for. Not automatically bad, but not necessarily good. When speaking to the crowd that disrupted the feast because they hungered and thirsted for righteousness, Jesus uses this metaphor of light and darkness to summarize his mission and his message. After performing numerous miracles, signs, and wonders, Jesus issues the final reminder of why the word had been made flesh. I have come as light unto the world so that whosoever believes in me should not remain in darkness. Unlike other instances throughout scripture, this light-darkness duality consists of moral overtones. The darkness Jesus speaks of is a spiritual darkness. It's the darkness of ignorance. It's the darkness of gross and dangerous errors. It's the darkness of failing to see the little bit of God or the glimmers of light within each of us. It's the darkness that is present when one chooses to consistently ignore whatever is good and just and true. To remain in darkness is not merely to choose ignorance but rather to decide to remain away from the will of God. Jesus came as light into the world. Yet as we, as many were determined not to honor that light. As a consequence, Jesus as a person of color was murdered by state sanctioned violence. He was wrongly targeted by the state, denied a fair trial, and those who upheld the status quo by simply not wanting to rock the boat or cause a scene would later admit, surely this man did not deserve to die. As it turns out, not many people are truly afraid of the dark. Instead, people are more so afraid of the light. There have been countless occasions in modern history where awful things have happened to people partly because others have failed to recognize the light that was within them. Six years ago today, Michael Brown Jr., an unarmed 18-year-old black man, was shot to death by, police, by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Someone failed to see Michael's light. 75 years ago today, just three days after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, a U.S. B-29 superfortress codenamed Boxcar dropped a nuclear device over Nagasaki, killing an estimated 74,000 people. Someone failed to see their light. 76 years ago today, because they did not have the same resources of other units, unsafe working conditions inspired 258 African-American sailors based at Port Chicago, California, to refuse to load a munitions ship just one month after a cargo vessel explosion killed 320 black men at the same port. As a result, 50 black soldiers went through questionable court-martial proceedings and were convicted of mutiny, fined, and imprisoned. Someone failed to see their light. Sadly, this isn't ancient history. Our failure to see the light in others continues today. The United States holds more Black adults in correctional control today than the total number of slaves that existed before the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Today, the current occupant of one Black Lives Matter plaza has appointed almost a quarter of all active federal judges, 194 to be exact, and has been more likely than any other recent occupant of the office to appoint a judge that is white. In fact, 
Of the 53 confirmed appeals court judges over the past four years, not one has been black. And only one has been a woman. Today, people are comfortable making performative acts of anti-racism whenever it's convenient, yet they do nothing about the systemic silencing of black voices in their places of work or worship. Today, people have no problem publicly declaring that black lives matter, yet the only black lives they care to call and check on are the ones they're paid to. Today, even in 2020, strange fruit is still found on Southern trees. It's not because people are afraid of the dark, but rather because they're afraid of the light. People are afraid of the light when high ranking politicians say things like, if they all voted, we'd never win another election. People are afraid of the light when folks walking their dogs in Central Park would rather recognize their white supremacy than admit when they're wrong. People are afraid of the dark when the police are called on a black man for loitering on his own yard simply because his neighbors believe that no person of color could afford a house that nice. Taking our cue from Jesus, we must continue to let our light shine even when it could mean trouble. The late Honorable John Robert Lewis often reminded us that there's nothing wrong with getting into good trouble. Jesus teaches us that when we're willing to get into good trouble, not even the grave can dim our lights. The good news is that we're all capable, capable of getting into some good trouble. Perhaps my favorite words in the entire text for this morning, particularly in the translations I read when growing up, is whenever Jesus says, whosoever. So many times throughout our history, we've taken that original Greek word out of context and attempted to limit what Jesus meant by whosoever. There are those who throughout history have tried to file exceptions on Jesus's whosoever. There was a time on this soil when whosoever did not include black and indigenous people and the nation relied on stolen hands to work stolen lands. There was a time on this soil when whosoever did not include Southern Europeans. There was a time on this soil when whosoever did not include certain people based upon their gender and sexuality. There was a time on this soil when Whosoever did not include folks based on their socioeconomic statuses. But we dare not be too self-righteous. For we all have our own stuff that needs to be worked out. In the words of the Apostle Paul, For the good that I would, I do not do. But the evil which I would not, that I do. And therefore I am so glad that Jesus's whosoever includes me too. But I've recently heard some foolish talk going around about making things great again. Now, that's a different sermon for a different day, but I'll just tell you what Martin King said. He says, if you want to be great, wonderful but recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's the new definition of greatness. By giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know Plato or Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of love and a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. 
the easiest way for us to serve is by answering Jesus' call to act on the things that we often pretend not to see. We can serve by working to increase women's representation in public office and other decision-making bodies critical to building a more just and equitable society. We can serve by ensuring our judicial systems eliminate mandatory minimum sentencing and support the reintegration of returning citizens. We can serve by advocating for the elimination of the wage gap by sex and race and the enforcement of anti-discrimination laws. We can serve by building a world where our children's dreams and imaginations move beyond the limitations of their social locations. Ryan Stevenson reminds us that we're all implicated when we allow others to be mistreated. And Jesus came to remind us that things do not have to remain the way they are. I know the road may get rough, but we must continue to let our lights shine. When you get discouraged, just remember, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. For I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Therefore, we will let our light shine. For we know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. We will let our lights shine. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, those who are called according to God's purpose. We will let our light shine. For God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. So shine on, for truth crushed to earth shall rise again. Shine on, for no lie can live forever. Shine on. For truth is forever on the scaffold and wrong is forever on the throne. Yet the scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God in the shadow, keeping watch above God's own. Shine on. In the words of the great gospel hymn, we will walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night, Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Won't you pray with me? Lord, In the stillness, we take a moment to intercede for our families, friends, our communities, for this nation and for our world. We reach out to you by faith, asking that your peace that surpasses all understanding will continue to guard our hearts and our minds through Christ. We seek you understanding that it's impossible for us to know what tomorrow brings, but because of who you are, we know that you hold our tomorrow. You keep us when times are tough. You sustain us in a world with systems full of imperfections. And you shower us. You cover us. You provide for us an abundance of grace for which we are thankful. Today, we pray for Leslie Anderson, Cecilia Artis, Jesse Barlow, Barbara Butler, Johnny Chainness, Laura Copeland, the friend of Sammy Harris, Dr. Ronald Lonesome. We pray for Margaret Madden, Megan Pell, the daughter of Pat Pell, Mitzi Prince, daughter-in-law of Kate Ellis, Dr. Cassandra Simmons, Ana Tavares, the grandmother of Eva Cordero. We lift up Libby Turnock, the sister of Judy Turnock, Lee Steinmetz and Vanessa Kumaro, 
relatives of Clive Kumro, Frank Verdejo, the brother of Petra Basket. Today we grieve with Diana Glasgow upon the death of her mother, Donna Jean Coquia. We grieve with Gladys Gonzalez upon the death of her husband, Jose Luis Gonzalez. We grieve with the Onyuku family upon the passing of their beloved mother and grandmother, Faustina Irozuma Uzebu. We lift these names and all others who are on our hearts and our minds today. And we take a moment to pause in silence to remember those who have lost their lives due to COVID-19. remaining forever thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray in the way that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with us. Let us share God's peace that is with us. May the peace of Christ be with you. May you use this time to share God's peace with someone that is with you. Send a text message. Drop a line in the chat. The peace of Christ be with you, Riverside family, and also with you. Good morning, Riverside. I want to introduce you to the faith-filled and courageous detainees. We volunteers at Riverside Sojourners Detention Visitation have the sorrow, but also the privilege of befriending. From the moment we first meet them, this United Nations reflecting every imaginable profession, skill, and history, dressed in their oversized institutional clothes, known to guards by by bed number, summoned from the dark hallway dorms, our friends are thanking us. We sit across from them at tables in the stark visiting room, and they take us on weary journeys, shyly sharing the terrifying and dehumanizing experiences of their exile. They pray with us, sing for us, their convictions of Allah, of God's grace, from their Sunday school classes and mosques, shrines, and temples. They bring us to tears when they show us a glimpse of their bruises, rope burns left by their torturers, or unweave the painful story of how they escaped from a mob intent on killing them because of their sexual identity. They weep for the wives, children, parents, brothers, sisters, their professions, their prosperity, or the simplest means to work and survive they've all left behind. Yet we find that even in the midst of their unjust detention, they're locked down in a for-profit prison in Elizabeth, New Jersey, a windowless converted warehouse. Amid their haunted remembrance of being in shackles and put in an unmarked van that took them to Elizabeth after brutal interrogation by Customs and Border Patrol officers at JFK, 
Still, they look up like shiny new children at the opportunities they believe our country will allow them to pursue. In normal times, sojourners sent teams of volunteers to visit detainees as friends two Saturday mornings each month. We followed up, exchanged letters, made phone calls, did whatever we could. Then the pandemic shutdown kept our friends in COVID-infected facilities, in virtual solitary confinement with limited or no access to phones, fresh air, medical attention, PPE, or visitors, and months or years of waiting to learn the outcome of their asylum. So we've been called to do much more, to send over $7,000 so detainees can purchase soap and bare necessities or obtain phone cards to call their family or attorney. Critically, we've explored ways to free them by raising $8,000 for bail bond release. Also out of these funds for those we knew as detainees and who have achieved asylum status, but who have lost their jobs or are ineligible for unemployment insurance. Sojourners has provided partial rent assistance connected them with food pantries, helped with fees for training and professional license, and in one case wired $1,800 for a starving family in immediate need of medical intervention back in the home country. As Sojourners volunteers, we are grateful to be able to share, to do this much, but funds are depleted, ongoing needs ballooning, our brothers and sisters crying everywhere. Giving your financial support, volunteering with Sojourners will answer some of these cries. In doing so, you begin to right a horrific wrong, relaunch a means to make a living or even save a life. Along with our volunteers, you will answer Christ's admonition to feed the hungry, close the naked, visit the imprisoned, and welcome and care for the strangers among us. Among the volumes of letters and personally delivered expressions of gratitude that our amazing detained and asylum friends give us, let me close with just one voice. Thank you for your generosity, truly a mark of compassion and one I never dreamed to still find at this time in your sad country. For everyone worshiping with us today, we invite you to give through our website at trcnyc.org backslash give. Uh, go to other and enter Sojourner, or uh, text to trcnyc, G-I-V-E, to 77977 by phone. Thank you.
Let's pray. Gracious God, you give us out of abundance of everything you are. Your kingdom is one that has no end. So as we are blessed, we become a blessing. Please take our gifts and multiply them and use them in your kingdom work for love and justice and help us to steward them well. Today, our, in our giving, we celebrate the work of the Sojourners Ministry, which works with people currently held in detention centers in the United States, while petitioning for asylum and providing support to those recently released. God, we partner with you with everything we have. Take our gifts and use them for your kingdom. In Jesus and your many names we pray. Amen. Friends, receive this benediction. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage, hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering. Honor all people. Love the Lord your God, ever rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Amen, and go in peace.